Hey, good morning, and uh, welcome to the Bridge Church. My name is Luke, and I just want to first of all welcome you. Thanks for coming, and thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, I'm going to go through just a few announcements kind of before we get into uh, worship. And first of all would be uh, the communication card. We would love it uh, to hear who's worshiping with us today, and the best way to do that is through the communication card. And that can be accessed through our app as well as on our website. Um, On the back of the communication card uh, is a space for prayer requests. And we take these very seriously and pray for these on a weekly basis. And so please take some time to let us know how you're doing and how we can be lifting you up in prayer. Um, Also, uh, if you are wondering what's going on this week in our church, the best way to get that information is by reading the weekly uh, bridge update email. Uh, If you do not have that and that's not coming, uh, first of all, check your spam folder because every once in a while it may be going in there. Uh, Otherwise, you could add that on the back of the communication card. Uh, Just say that you would like to get onto that email blast and we'll make sure that you get added. Also, uh, growth groups have started. Uh, We just finished up the second week of growth groups, and it's going awesome. We've got a lot of people signed up and attending, uh, but there is still room. So if you would still like to get plugged in, there's uh, a possibility of doing that, uh, as well as our bridge building opportunities. Uh, So make sure, uh, if you're interested, that you can get more information on our website, as well as uh, the app or that email, that uh, update email that I was talking about. Um, Lastly, we have set a date for our next uh, in-person worship service. So that's super exciting. I can't wait to see all of you. Um, The next uh, in-person service is going to be March 14th at 10 o'clock at the Children's Theater. And so uh, super excited. Can't wait to see all of you. And uh, I just pray that that we would have uh, good planning uh, and safety and the resources uh, for that service, uh, for the service. So please join me in prayer uh, for that as well as our service. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to praise you, to worship you together, even though we're apart. Uh, Lord, I pray that um, our worship to you would just be pleasing to you, Lord, that it would be a sweet aroma as it comes up to you. And Lord, I also pray that we would learn more about you, both through worship and through the sermon as well, Lord. I pray that you would reveal Uh, parts of yourself to us about who you are and how you want us to apply different uh, things to areas of our life. Lord, we love you. And and Lord, as we continue through this uh, season of COVID and and begin to plan to worship together in person, Lord, I pray that you would just give us a spirit of grace and understanding as we are all coming back uh, with different perspectives and, and ideas. And, and Lord, I just, I pray that we would all love each other well, that we would have grace towards one another and love for each other and uh, love for your community, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2 Corinthians 12, um, Paul was writing about a thorn in his flesh, and he said he pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away. <clears throat> but God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, the insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong.
Hello, everybody. Um, this is our Thursday evening growth group and uh, Willie and Laura leading. And we just want to say hello to everybody. We hope uh, you're having a chance to um, get involved with some studies as well. We're excited to see each other, hopefully uh, in a couple of weeks or so, that we'll be getting back to services. Hope everyone's doing well. Hi, everybody. I'm Adam Nawago. Um, God bless you all, and I can't wait to see everybody in person again. I'm another Adam in the group. This I'm Adam Condit with my wife, Alicia, and we are definitely excited to, to be more face-to-face -face and to see everyone in this group and uh, everyone in the other groups and at the Sunday gathering. We miss you. Big time. Margaret Rass. Hi, everybody. I miss Hi, you. Michaela, and this we is John. See you. I'm Michaela, and this is John, and we're new, um, but have enjoyed getting to know some people through the small group. Casey and Brianna Shields over here, and Joe is joining us. Um, yeah, it's been it's been good to to keep in touch uh, digitally, but um, definitely miss the face to face time with uh, the rest of the, the body, and it's just been um, yeah been an interesting year so far, but um, we'll definitely be looking forward to um, opportunities to see everybody and, and catch up and be more connected. But it's, uh, it's been good, good to use the tools that we have to, uh, to stay together in this time. So hope you all are doing well. Welcome back, Bridge family. Uh, it's so good to be with you this week. And I think Luke mentioned already for us that um, we want to be back and to worship in person on March 14th. And I'm really excited about that. I hope you're looking forward to that, uh, to be together and to see each other uh, week by week. And I just want to remind us, you know, when we do that, we've, we've got some time to plan for this. When we do that, um, we're going to need some help. We're going to need some volunteers. We're going to need some people to help with the, with the tech team and with bridge kids and with ushers and with greeters, uh, with worship team. And um, I hope that some of you will start thinking about what role you're going to play when we come back together on March 14th. So let's get back together. Let's do this as a team. We've been in a series called The Road to Redemption. And today we're going to look at part three. And the passage we're looking at is chapter 14, verses 53 through 72 from the Gospel of Mark. Did you know that new research has revealed that telling kids of real life superheroes and geniuses, it's a good thing, provided that you tell them about the struggles that they have faced along the way. For example, when students are told about the achievements of people like Albert Einstein, a Nobel Prize winner, or Madame Curie, a two-time Nobel Prize winner, students tend to feel insecure about their own abilities in comparison. It's actually counterproductive to tell students that someone is a genius or highly gifted. Kids are more likely to say, I could never do that. But if you tell kids stories of great achievements of someone who has struggled and, and made mistakes and had to overcome difficulties, kids are more likely to have hope and to engage in learning and understanding. And that's really kind of good news for us when you think about it. We all fail. We all make mistakes. We're all imperfect. We all have struggles and we all can grow and we can all change. We have potential to overcome difficult hurdles that we face in life. The Bible has many characters that um, made a lot of mistakes and they overcome their, the obstacles that they faced. One of those is the Apostle Peter, and we know him well. He overcame many mistakes, and he kept learning, and he kept following. Our series, The Road to the Redemption, and today is part three. Tried, 
and tested. Jesus is tried and Peter is tested. Last week, Jesus predicted Peter's denial. Then Jesus and his disciples went to the Garden of Gethsemane and there Jesus poured out his heart to God. And he also poured out his heart to his disciples. Then Jesus on that night was betrayed and then he was arrested. So we come to uh, the religious trial in verses 53 through 65. And I'm going to read from Mark 14 and want to encourage you to follow in your Bibles or on your smartphone. We're going to look at Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 53. Let's look at this together. Verse 53. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and and beat him. So let's look at this religious trial. There are going to be three phases to this trial. Uh, Mark is going to take uh, kind of a concise report, and he's really going to uh, report for uh, two of these phases in this trial. We see the situation in verses 53 and 54. Uh, Jesus is now taken to the religious authorities in verse 53. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Now, this may seem a little confusing. There was only supposed to be one high priest and one high priest at a time. And and technically, there was only one. But during this time, kind of an unusual time in their history, there were two. Caiaphas was the high priest. But his father-in-law had been deposed by the Romans earlier, and he had earlier been the high priest. And they are both alive, which is a little unusual because a new high priest typically didn't get appointed until the death of the former high priest. So there are two, Caiaphas, the son-in-law, and Annas, the father-in-law. Annas is very, very influential. And in fact, John records that Jesus was first taken to Annas' house. Mark just bypasses that because it's sort of like along the way to Caiaphas' house. And Annas may be the most influential leader of all of the leaders. But Caiaphas is the high priest. Um, Jesus now comes to Caiaphas' house. And he appears before several religious leaders, the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law. Um, If you know the story, even if you know the gospel of John, Jesus wasn't surprised by any of this. I want to go back and look at Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. And um, so this is earlier. This is uh, perhaps months earlier. Jesus, 
verse 31, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. The Son of Man is a term that Jesus most often used of himself. Um, he would be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And after that, after three days, rise again. And so um, Jesus had clearly told his disciples what was to come, that he would be arrested by the religious leaders, that he would be killed, and that he would rise again. Verse 32, he spoke plainly about this. Peter took him aside. This is one of Peter's failures, by the way. Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked Jesus to point out, Jesus, you're wrong. You're not going to die. They're not going to kill you. Verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said, because Peter was representing the world system and their viewpoint. He says, you do not have the mind in, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And by the way, that's where, that's where Satan hangs out, is in the concerns of human desires and wants, not in the concerns of God. Then not, lot, not long after this, Jesus predicted his, his death another time. And that's in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. I just, this is so important. I just want us to see this again because this is happening uh, just before uh, all these things happen and the, and the disciples are just totally surprised. But Jesus had been predicting these things. Verse 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem. So when Jesus took this term and when this happens in the gospel of Mark, very clearly, Jesus knows he's headed for death. He is on the road to redemption, uh, clearly at this point. And, and, and he takes on a really serious tone. Um, they're on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. The disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. So there was some fear about what lies ahead among some of the people. And again, he took the 12 aside, the, the disciples, and he told them what was going to happen. Next slide. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests. So somebody's going to turn him over, and, and the teachers of the law, and they will condemn him to death. And so that's something we learn new, that he's going to be condemned to death, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and that will be the Romans who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. So um, Jesus is just very clear, and the disciples have had quite a few clues about what is to come. And one of the things we see again and again is Jesus' ability to predict the future and what is going to happen. In verse 54, we see Peter's good intentions. Um, remember last week, Peter had so many good intentions. Verse 50, um, for Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Now, Peter's not giving up on his good intentions. He's going to follow Jesus, but not closely. He's going to hang back a bit. He's going to prove to Jesus that he, he's not going to let him down. Um, Mark leaves this out. But Peter went um, to the chief priest's house with another disciple. And John tells, it, tells us who it is. It's John. The apostle John is the one who went with Peter. And Peter has to wait outside because we know from the Gospel of John that um, John's family was a friend of the high priest. And so uh, John has an in to uh, what's going on. He has access to the high priest's home. And so John has to go in and then he has to come out and then he goes to the gate 
and he gets permission for Peter to come inside the courtyard. Um, it's cold at night. There's a fire going. You can almost hear the sound of it crackling. And they're trying to keep, there's a bunch of servants and, and some of the temple police are gathered around. They're not allowed to go uh, inside. And Jesus is inside. Peter is outside. And, and next we have the investigation, verses 55 through 56. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. Comment about the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is a ruling body, the highest religious authority in the land of Israel. In total, there are 71 in this group. And they would sort of be like the United States Senate and the U.S. Supreme Court together in their authority. And um, notice their approach here. They were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. Are they searching for truth? Not really. They have already reached their verdict. Now they just want to find evidence to prove it. Jesus is condemned already. Jesus is found guilty from the start. Jesus was found guilty before there was any proof. And it says, Mark says, they did not find any. There, there was no evidence. Verse 56, many testified falsely against him, but their, their statements didn't agree. They needed two witnesses who could tell the truth Two of them that would agree in their story. Um, now, think about this. This is in the middle of the night. Most people are in bed. And they have gathered all of these witnesses to testify against Jesus in the middle of the night. Um, they just all happened to be available. The problem was they just couldn't get their story straight. Verses 57 through 59, we see the accusations, more accusations. And the false reports continue. Verse 57, then some stood up and gave false testimony against him. So more, of, more witnesses appear. Verse 58, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands. And in three days, we'll build another not made with human hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. So they have taken words here similar to what Jesus spoke earlier, kind of out of context and kind of creative in how they stated the words back. That's not what was actually said. If we go to John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, we can see what Jesus said at the temple very early in his ministry. And uh, perhaps this was known and not understood. Verse 19, Jesus is in the temple. He's talking to the religious leaders. He answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He did not say, I will destroy the temple. He said, destroy this temple, um, second person, plural, you destroy the temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. This was Herod's temple that Herod had built. It took 46 years. It had been under construction all 46 years. It is still under construction during the days of Jesus. And he says, and you're going to raise it in three days? Who do you think you are? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. He wasn't talking about the physical structure in Jerusalem. He was using a metaphor. He was talking about his very own body. Um, it's a little bit like the Apostle Paul. When, when the Apostle Paul said, our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus speaks of his body as a temple. Verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. You know, this might be one of the most important issues that you have to deal with. 
Can you believe the scripture? And can you believe the words that Jesus has spoken? And not only this time, but day by day as you go throughout your life, as you walk with Christ. In verses 60 through 61, the intense questioning continues, the interrogation. Verse 60, the high priest stood up and before them asked Jesus, are you going to answer? So it's like Caiaphas is growing impatient with the situation. All these witnesses have come forward. One after another, they do not agree on the facts. And this is really starting to bother Caiaphas. And uh, so now he, he pressures Jesus. He's, he's trying to get Jesus uh, to make some kind of a mistake. He says, what is this testimony uh, that these men are bringing against you? He sort of hammers Jesus with questions. What do you have to say about this, Jesus? All of these witnesses, they all can't be wrong, can they? And so uh, he pressures Jesus. Verse 61, Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Jesus doesn't play this game. He doesn't get involved. He, he, he remains silent. And we are reminded of Isaiah 53, 53, verse 7. And he remains silent like a sheep before his shears. Jesus doesn't have to have the last word. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Now, this is a different kind of question. Uh, the term the Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one, the holy one, the one promised in the Old Testament that the Old Testament believers were looking forward to, that one day God would spend, send this special person and he would be the Messiah which is the very same word for the Christ. Messiah is the Hebrew term. Christ is the Greek term, Old Testament term, and a New Testament term. Um, and then he says, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? It's the only time that God is referred to as the blessed one. But that's the way the high priest could speak of God without mentioning God's name or using the term for God because they never wanted to take God's name in vain. It was so important to their religiosity. Jesus cannot remain silent. Jesus must speak. And we see the confession in verse 62. Look what Jesus says. I am. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? I am. And Jesus has used that terminology many times just by saying I, I am I am the good shepherd I am the way the truth and the life seven times there are I am statements and very likely identifying him with Exodus chapter 3 when God reveals himself to Moses as the I am but Jesus says I am and then he adds this this is amazing and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one. And he alludes back to Psalm 110, verse 1. And this was a messianic psalm. And they understood what he was saying about himself, that he would be sitting at the right hand of the mighty one, the right hand of God, the most powerful and authoritative position uh, next to the Father. And then you'll see this son of man, that term that he used for himself, sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. They knew what he was saying. They knew he was identifying with Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And I want to look back at that passage, Daniel 7, 13 and verse 14. This is about 600 years before the birth of Christ. And Daniel writes, in my vision at night. So so Daniel, the prophet, has a supernatural vision from God in my vision at night. And I looked, and, and there before me was one like a son of man. This is a mystery figure. We don't know who this person is. He, he is human-like. 
and one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. That's what Jesus referred to. And he approached the ancient of days. That's a name for God, um, referring to his eternality as, as a creator and was led into his presence. This son of man was led into the very presence of the father. And he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Uh, the, 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 the Old Testament believers understood this was God coming in judgment in the future. And this one like the Son of Man has authority, he has glory, he has sovereign power. Sovereign is like over all. And all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. Worship is only for the true God. And all of this worship is going to the one like the Son of Man. And His dominion, His Lordship is an everlasting dominion. It's not going to end. And it will not pass away. And His kingdom, He's going to be an eternal king, is one that will never be destroyed. That is a powerful a statement, and Jesus identifies himself as this person. And this is going to make one angry group of people. And, and we see this in verses uh, 63 and 65, the charge, the charge against Jesus. The high priest tore his clothes. This was like a display of godliness for the high priest. Or we might say a display of hypocrisy. His ears have been offended by Jesus and tearing his inner garment was a way of practicing grief over, over sin. Um, the high priest says, why do we need any more witnesses? We don't because in his mind, Jesus has just confessed to the worst possible sin. Um, He's, the high priest has heard enough. He's done. Jesus has committed blasphemy. And blasphemy is when someone makes a claim to be God. Um, there, and there's only one true God. The only problem with this is what if the one who claims to be God is God? Verse 64, the high priest says, you, you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? The high priest believes that he sealed the case now with this confession from Jesus. And, and uh, so he, he asks the group, and, and this, is, um, this is not the Sanhedrin officially gathered, but this is an unofficial meeting in the middle of the night. Um, and they all con condemned him as worthy of death. Those members uh, who were present of the Sanhedrin agree with Caiaphas. Their minds are made up. Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. In verse 65, then some began to spit at him. These are the religious leaders. These are the dignified leaders of Israel. And one of the ways you can tell who they are is by the way they are dressed. They are formal clergy. And they begin to uh, spit at him. And they blindfolded him. And they struck him with their fists. Now, how tough is that? And they said, prophesy. The the religious leaders immediately become indignant and disrespectful. They dishonor Jesus and they treat him with contempt and humiliation. They call on Jesus to prophesy because, and, 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 and this is kind of tongue in cheek. It's kind of humorous on their part uh, because they, they knew that the, the Messiah was going to be able to prophesy and foretell the future. And uh, so they, they want Jesus to join in this game and, and they challenge him to prophesy. But, you know, he's already done that, hasn't he? He just did. He told them that they're going to see him one day. They were sitting in judgment on him. But one day they will see him coming at the right hand of God 
in the clouds, and he's going to come and he's going to be their judge. And then the guards took him and they beat him. Not only did these dignified religious leaders spit on him and strike him with their fists, now the guards, who were the Jewish uh, temple police, join in and they beat Jesus as well. For Jesus, he is on trial and it's not over. He has appeared illegally in the middle of the night before these religious leaders. They do not have the authority uh, to, to put Jesus to death for blasphemy. They must seek approval from the government. They must go to Pilate. And we're going to look at that next week, the, 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 the trial of the government. As we conclude this uh, passage today, we come to a disciple's test in verses 66 through 72. Meanwhile, Peter is taking his own exam. Verses 66, it's truth-telling failure number one. It's the first part of Peter's test. Look at verse uh, 66. Well, Peter was below in the courtyard, so Peter's in the house. That's where all these people are gathered. Caiaphas has a home that has the upper room. It's very large, so uh, a large number of people, large enough to hold at least 71 uh, for, for the Sanhedrin to gather. And um, so Peter is below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You, you were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. Now, Jesus has been up quite a while. There was the Last Supper in the evening. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed then he got arrested. Then he was taken to Annas' house. Then he's taken to Caiaphas' house. And uh, hours have passed since the arrest. Now, because it was cold at night, Peter was warming himself with others. And then just one of the high priest's servants, a young girl, notices Peter. And she says, you're one of Jesus' followers. But he denied it, verse 68. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Peter pulls away, and he totally denies that he knows Jesus personally. He's embarrassed. He's defensive. He is fearful of being found out. The second failure is in verses 69 and 70, the truth-telling failure Number two, verse 69, when the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around. So there's a group of people. And very likely, we know that Peter is going to deny Jesus three times. There is a group of people, and Peter probably got challenged more than three times by different people because it was a group, and there was quick agreement. And so the girl just won't let it go. She knows she is right. She knows that Peter was a friend of Jesus. And, and Peter is still trying to deflect uh, attention away from himself. Verses 70 and 71, failure number three. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely, so this is a group, those standing near, surely you are one of them for you are a Galilean. Peter is recognized for being a Galilean. How, how did they know? Was it the way he dressed? No, it was probably the way he spoke more than anything. He was not from here. He was not from Jerusalem. Peter was an uneducated outsider. He was kind of a hick in some people's eyes. In verse 71, he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I, I don't know this man. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. So uh, Peter was, was making a claim that if I'm lying, may, may God curse me or may God condemn me. He's not really just swearing like uh, we sometimes t t talk about swearing, but he was calling a curse on himself if in fact he were, he were lying which he is. Um, 
He tries to cover up the truth, and he tries to deny Jesus for the third time. And finally, we see the truth in verse 72. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. This is going to be painful. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. Mark doesn't tell us when the rooster crowed the first time, only the second. And Peter remembers. He remembers that Jesus had prophesied this. Jesus was right again. And Peter was broken. He was cut to the quick, immediate pain. He had done exactly what he said he would not. He had boasted. He'd made a promise to Jesus that very night, a promise that he couldn't keep in his own strength. And he had failed Jesus miserably. Let's talk about some lessons. Let's talk about some lessons. The first one, following Jesus at a distance is a risky way to follow Christ. Following at a distance. Peter is a good example. He was literally following Jesus at a geographical distance. He wasn't in that close relationship that he had been. He was fearful and he was afraid. But metaphorically, there is a lesson here as well. Having an on-again, off-again relationship with Christ is not following Christ. Some Christ followers try to follow Jesus at a spiritual distance. They focus more on their own needs and their own values and their own wants than than Jesus's. Uh, They want to be close to Jesus when they're in trouble. They want to be close when they find themselves in a crisis. When we put our views and our values ahead of Jesus, we are at risk for failure. It may be small. It may be really big. And we need to be close to Jesus and be able to rely on him and to rely on his resources 24-7, not just periodically. The writer of Hebrews warns us, be careful lest you drift away. It's so easy to move away from Jesus just by letting our lives slide. Second lesson, prejudging someone before understanding the facts leads to faulty conclusions. Prejudging before understanding the facts leads to false conclusions. The religious leaders had determined Jesus was guilty long before they had the facts. Jesus had made them mad. Jesus uh, was more popular with, with, with the common people. He seemed to always have the answers. He could hold the attention of large crowds for hours, and people trusted him. Sometimes Jesus even did miracles, and the religious leaders had a tendency to believe that they were done in the power of Satan. Satan. They were prejudiced. And you know what? We can be like the religious leaders. We can be prejudiced too. We sometimes prejudge people before we really know them or understand the truth or the facts. We form a conclusion without enough information. It may be the color of their skin. We prejudge them. We have a prejudice. It may be the way they dress. It may be where they work. It may be how they talk. Um, It's just easy to prejudge somebody. And we need to treat all people with dignity and be very careful about making judgments about people. Third lesson Distorting the truth totally dishonors God. It may seem obvious, but distorting the truth totally dishonors God. The, the religious leaders ta- uh, sought to distort the truth. They, they should have been 
the champions of truth for God's people. But they were seeking to distort the truth. They were looking to protect themselves and their positions. They were trying to put a spin on their story about Jesus so that the results would be Jesus would be condemned. Now, maybe we're not trying to condemn anybody to death, but we too can be tempted to put a spin on our stories to make us look good, to protect ourselves, to defend ourselves. Uh, And if we distort the truth, if we're dishonest, uh, we dishonor God. The fourth lesson, having the last words doesn't necessarily honor God. Having the last word doesn't necessarily honor God. Jesus was silent before the religious leaders. He only spoke briefly to identify himself and his uh, future role. The religious leaders, especially the high priests, sought to be in control and to have the final say about Jesus' outcome. They were vocal, they were emotional, they were brutal. Now, did Jesus win or lose this trial? Who dishonored God? Who honored God? Was it Jesus or was it the religious leaders? The very last lesson, number five, God restores those who are broken and contrite about their sin. Peter failed Jesus big time. Now, we can look at Peter and we can see him denying Jesus three times. And we might say, well, I don't think I would do that. And, and maybe you wouldn't. The great thing about Peter's story is that after he failed, Peter came back. He was humbled. He saw Jesus in a new way. He was broken and contrite. He was repentant. He wanted to change. He wanted to get right back with God. And then he was moldable and pliable in the hands of God. Peter learned from his struggles. He learned to overcome difficult things. And he learned to grow through these. And that gives us all hope because we all fail Jesus. We all struggle, sometimes more than others. And the good news is we can, like Peter, we can can be forgiven and we can be fully restored in our relationship with God. So if you find yourself at, at a distance with God today, just move closer to him. Uh, he wants to be near to you. Humble yourself. And if you need to, just be honest and tell God about your failures. Get back on course and lean into God and ask him for his strength and his wisdom and his leadership in your life. Please join me in prayer. Father, I thank you from what we can learn from Peter's failures and to watch his life and to see him do things that are honoring to you and to see the man he will become. Thank you that we can learn from Peter's mistakes, his failures. We can see him restored and we can have hope. God, may we be honest before you. May we speak truth to you. May we ask you to shine your light on our hearts so that we are exposed and we can acknowledge that which is true. Father, as um, we look at the failure of the religious leaders, we are religious kind of people. We, pr- we proclaim to be Christians. May we not fall into the mistakes that religious people can make as they, as at times they can be legalistic, at times they, they can... Be, um, make tradition more important than, than truth or, or their values, their political values can be 
more important than the truth? May we not prejudge people. God, show us when we're prejudiced. Show us when we do not value people, when we do not treat people with dignity, when we rush to conclusions about people without knowing them, without having um, the truth, just judging them for a few things that we see that appear to us. May your church represent you well and honor you. For Jesus' sake I pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. Uh, it's great to worship and, and continue our series on the road to redemption. Uh, we will see you next week virtually.